Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 11th lecture of the course on Sociological Perspectives on Modernity. Before dwelling upon the structuralist interpretation of the critical modernist paradigm in sociology, it is important to revise, to recapitulate whatever we have discussed in the context of the classic statements about critical modernist paradigm in sociology. Namely, Marx on modernity and Weber on modernity. Okay? Uh, very quickly in this lecture, we will try to cover, we will try to recapitulate the classic statements about uh, sociological modernity. Let us first start with uh, uh, Marx on modernity, but, but Marx's views about modernity that we have already discussed it requires certain methodological warnings. Okay? I mean, when, I, when we discuss Marx on modernity, Marx on modernity cannot be isolated from Marx's method itself, Marx's theoretical positions themselves. Okay? Marx's method includes materialist conception of history that we have already discussed that matter is prior to the formation of idea. Uh, I mean, um, uh, how uh, Marx said uh, in, in a preface to a uh, contribution to a critique of political economy that it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary their social existence that determines their consciousness. Okay? I mean, then, then the principles of dialectic, I mean the, the, the interpenetration of the opposites, quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and the law of negation of negation okay? and the theory of ideology. When I say theory of ideology, Marx has to be evaluated uh, not simply as, as, as Marx as an uh, ideologue of the communist party, but also Marx as a theoretician okay? and, and theory of knowledge, theory of science, okay? because science is one of the markers of modernity um, in the context of the enlightenment, in the context of uh, the industrial revolution and so on. Okay? Let us first, then we, we are going to discuss these, these, these four parameters one is materialist conception of history, dialectic, theory of ideology uh, and, and theory of science or knowledge. Okay? Okay? I mean we have already discussed these things in part, but now we will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to recapitulate okay? the, the views on modernity by both Marx and Weber. Let us first start with Marx's uh, materialist conception of history or, or popularly known as historical materialism. Marx's historical materialism, I mean can be uh, figured out through his uh, uh, work on a preface to a, a, critique, uh, a contribution to a critique of political economy of 1859. 
for 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 example nikos uh, polanjas has provided a threefold uh, classification of the concepts of uh, uh, of of the the concepts specific to historical materiality okay uh, i mean what is that threefold classification of the concept specific to historical materiality i mean marx is historical materiality first historical materiality first historical materiality is a theory of history on condition that certain of its concepts are transhistorical that is to say they have some valid applicability in all historical forms of society whether it is slavery or feudalism or capitalism it is always the relationship between labor and capital it is the relationship between labor power those who between those who sell their labor and and those who live off live off their labor those who sell their labor power on the one hand and those who uh, are who own the means of production okay that's why it is transhistorical in nature okay it is it is you will find similar kind of tendency in all historical stages of society be it slavery or feudalism or capitalism okay i mean such concepts include uh, modes of production raw materials instruments and relations of production property relations and relations of appropriation okay uh, uh, uh labor and uh, uh social formation i mean i mean uh possibly possibly um, the concepts of a theory of transition between social formations and the concepts of the different structural levels within a mode of production and social formation when i say social formation i mean the political the ideological and the economic formations polanges um uh, calls the theoretical structure formed by these concepts the general theory of historical materiality okay uh, then it is very important to understand um, i mean the first point that that historical materiality is a theory of history on the condition on the premise that certain of its concepts are transhistorical in nature okay that is to say that they have some valid applicability in historical forms of society and these concepts include uh, modes of production raw materials uh, instruments and relations of production property relations and relations of real appropriation labor and capital uh, uh, formation possibly the concepts of a theory of transition between social formation and the concepts of uh, the different structural levels within a mode of production and social formation namely the political the ideological and the economic okay this is known as a general the the, the uh, i mean this is uh, uh, the it is called the it is known as uh, this is known as the the theoretical structure formed by the concepts uh, 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 i mean the general theory of uh, historical materiality then what is historical in historical materialism and what is materialism in historical materialism it is very important to know what is historical in historical materialism historical the term historical entailed the the analysis of how particular forms of society have uh, had had come into existence and the specific historical contexts within which uh, apparently universal or eternal social forms were located then historical entailed the analysis of how particular forms of society had come into existence and the specific historical contexts within which apparently not really 
apparently universal social uh, uh, or or universal or apparently universal social forms or apparently eternal social forms were located. What are they? They appear to us as universal, eternal. They are not going to die out. They are not going to disappear. They are going to uh, exist here for all time to come. It appears to us, that, but actually it is not. Who, what, the, the, let me, let me give you a few examples of which, which appear to us as universal or eternal social forms, but actually uh, it is not. Let me give you a few examples. I mean, the state, religion, market and so on. Okay. It, it appear, for, for Marx, it appears to us that the state is going to exist for all time to come, the market is going to exist for all time to come, religion is going to exist for all, all time to come. It appears to us, but actually they are not. They are going to disappear. But we have to understand the, the historical contexts against the, oh, I mean, uh, I mean we have to understand the specific historical contexts uh, within which these apparently universal or eternal social for, forms are located or situated. Then what is materialism in historical materialism? No, materialism denoted the, the rejection of Hegelian ideology and the primacy of socio-economic processes and relations. Materialism denotes the, the rejection of Hegelian ideology. I mean, Hegelian idealism suggested that no ideas are prior to the formation of matter, whereas Marx's materialism suggests that no ideas are not uh, prior to the formation of matter, rather matter is prior to the formation of ideology. In what sense? Now, when we uh, uh, place our socio-economic processes and relations on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis -vis other political, ideological uh, processes uh, and so on. This is the first. Then, then what is the second one? The, I mean secondly, there are particular, uh, uh, there are the particular theories whose concepts provide the theoretical analysis of each of the modes of production. Okay. This is important. I mean there are certain polit pat pat particular theories whose concepts provide the, the, uh, uh, the theoretical analysis of, of each of the modes of production, namely hunting and gathering economy, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism and communism, which, which, uh, which are identified in the, in the general theory of historical literature. The, the particular theory of the capitalist mode of production includes as constituent concepts of the concept of commodity, the distinction between use and exchange value, the distinction between labor and labor power, the concepts of uh, money and of capital itself um, and the distinctions between uh, constant capital and variable capital and between value and surplus value and the concepts of profit, interest and capitalist ground rent um, and, and, and also the concepts of uh, uh, neo economic structures i mean namely what are these new neo economic structures i mean ideological structures and political structures okay which are characteristic of the capitalist mode of production okay uh, it is also important to 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 uh, understand the significance of trade unions political parties a definite range of forms of the state and a specific form of family and so on Okay. Then first we discussed in the first point Marx's uh, uh, materialist conception of history that Marx's historical materialism uh, okay, 
uh, is a theory of history on the condition that certain of its concepts are transhistorical in nature that is to say that they have some valid applicability in all historical forms of society. Okay? I mean the general theory of uh, historical materiality. Okay? Secondly, there are the particular th theories whose concepts provide this theoretical uh, analysis of each of the modes of production namely hunting and gathering economy, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism and, and community which are identified in the general theory of historical materialism. And the particular theory of the capitalist mode of production includes different concepts commodity. What is a commodity that has got exchange value? Okay? May not have use value, but it must have exchange value. Okay? The, the, that is why the, uh, the, the distinction between use value and exchange value is important. The distinction between labor and labor power is important. Okay? The concepts of money and of capital, what is the difference between wealth and capital? Wealth is a stock, whereas capital is a flow. Okay? The, the, the distinctions between variable and constant capital, okay? that is why we, we talked, uh, we have already discussed how, how only labor is, is, is very important in, in Ricardian or, uh, and, and Mar Marx's uh, uh, theory of value, uh, labor is very important because land is considered uh, uh, constant capital or fixed capital, uh, labor is a variable capital capital itself is generated through labor uh, and entrepreneur is one more labor. Okay? Then uh, the distinction between value and surplus value, surplus labor, okay? I mean if, if uh, al, uh, one unit of labor uh, uh, earns uh, 100 rupees uh, uh, or, or 80 rupees, 80 rupees for 8 hours uh, uh, of work a day, then for over time uh, if, if she or he is getting engaged in uh, uh, overtime activities, then, then the wage gets reduced in fact, okay? the surplus flame, surplus flame. Okay. The concept of profit, the concept of profit, interest and rent, capitalist ground rent, okay. they, they are owned by, they are handled by, they are appropriated by a very few individuals in the society, a few groups in the society, leaving the large masses, large population, huge population uh, uh, with, with penury, impoverishment. Okay. Okay. These are, these are, these are and also the concepts of new economic st uh, structures, I mean political, ideological and so on, okay. they, are, they are very much characteristics of, of capitalist mode of production. Okay. And it is also in this context, it is very important to understand the significance of trade unions, civil society, uh, political parties and so on. Um, and also, also the state, the nature of the state, the specific form of family and so on. Okay. And thirdly, there are what Bollinger calls regional theories. Okay. I mean, what are these regional theories? Okay. The, 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 I mean, um, I mean that is why, that is why uh, Marx also talked about Asiatic mode of production. Okay. It, is, is, it is very important to understand that the, the, the kind of mode of production that we witnessed, uh, today we witness in Europe or North American uh, continent, we do not tend to see that kind of mode of production in India or Latin America or Africa. Okay? It requires, we, we, we must 
ensure to develop certain regional theories which are of particular structural levels or regions within each mode of production. Okay. Then, then there are three important elements. I mean, that, that uh, as, as uh, Nikos Polanjas has provided a threefold classification of the concepts of concepts specific to historical materialism. Okay. First, Marx's historical materialism is a, is a theory of history on the condition that certain of its concepts are transhistorical in nature. That is to say, uh, that they have some valid applicability um, in all historical forms of society. Okay. I mean general theory of historical materialism, we have also discussed what is historical in historical materialism and materialism in historical materialism. Okay. Secondly, there are particular theories whose concepts provide the, the, the theoretical analysis of each of the modes of production namely hunting and gathering economy, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism and community, okay, uh, which are identified in the general theory of historical materialism. And, 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 and uh, I mean the, the, this, this particular theory of the capitalist mode of production okay, uh, includes um, um, as constituent concepts the concept of commodity, the distinction between use and exchange value, the distinction between labor and labor power, the concepts of money and of capital itself, the, the distinctions between variable and constant capital, between value and surplus value, the concepts of profit, rent and the capitalist ground rent and also the concepts of neo economic structures characteristic of the capitalist mode of production, trade unions, political parties, a definite range of forms of state or specific forms of uh, a specific form of family and so on. Okay. And, and thirdly, the uh, uh, there are what Polanjas calls, uh, Polanjas calls uh, regional theories. Mm, uh, I mean, these regional theories are of, uh, of the particular structural levels or regions within each mode of production. Okay. This is, this is uh, broadly materialist conception of history or Marx's materialist conception of history. Then, then, then what is the what are the principles of of dialectic what is dialectic first of all popularly known as dialectical materialism okay that the 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 term dialectic refers to the art of a dialogue in the form of an argumentation it expresses i mean the term dialectic expresses the view that development depends on the class of contradictions or the creation of a new more advanced synthesis out of these classes, out of these contradictions, out of these um, conflicts. Okay. The dialectical process involves three movements, one thesis, antithesis and synthesis. And Marx used the, the, the notion of dialectic to account for social and historical events, but, but Engels extended the scope of dialectical ana analysis so far to establish it as a general law of development that applied equally into social, natural and intellectual spheres. Okay. He, uh, I, I, mean, uh, I mean particularly Engels was very much influenced by the, by the works of uh, Charles Darwin, the biologist. Okay. That is why uh, it is very important uh, uh, to, to uh, understand how Engels was deeply in, engrossed in, in the dialectics of nature. Okay. I mean, uh, Engels in fact believed that the real world whether of, of society or of nature developed according to dialectical sequences of contradictions and th syntheses and that the dialectical logic was the means by which one could comprehend this development. How did Marx and Weber come to this point? 
I mean drawing lessons from Hegel's dialectic and Feuerbach's materialism, both Marx and Engels have propounded the principles of dialectical and historical materialism. I mean the principles of dialectic and materialist conception of history. When Engels was deeply engrossed in, in, in the dialectic of nature, okay, Marx found out their social applicability in the course of the development of human society. Okay. The, the principles of dialectical materialism in sort are the interpenetration of the opposites or unity and struggle of opposites. Secondly, quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and vice versa. I mean quantitative changes lead to qualitative changes and qualitative changes also lead to quantitative changes and the principle of uh, I mean the law of I mean the theory of negation of negation. Okay. I mean if you if you if you look at this okay if you uh, look at this the, the 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 principles of dialectic for for marx human history is a part of part of history of nature it is basically a movement of nature developing towards man towards human beings marx always uh, spoke about the unity of science, I mean man of science, man of nature and so on. Okay. According to Marx, science will in time incorporate into itself the science of man just as science of man will incorporate into itself the science of nature. This, I mean at the end of there will be one science, I mean, and, I mean the social reality of nature and natural science of uh, human beings are identical terms. I mean then how to understand nature? Okay. I mean for Marx human beings are the immediate objects of natural sciences and nature is the immediate object of science of human beings, human species. Okay. How to arrive at that? How did he arrive at that? I mean for him, for, for Marx sense perceptions are the basis of all sciences. Sensuousness of man is human sensuousness and sensuousness is looked at only by looking at others. I mean uh, suppose man A looks at man B, man B also looks at man A, I mean woman, woman A looks at woman B, woman B looks at woman A. Okay. I mean sensuousness Okay, is is looked at only by looking at others. Okay, for 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 Marx, human actions change the world. Human actions change nature. That's why in 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 man nature relationship we have already discussed. I mean, there are there are different things that uh, earlier literature suggests that nature controls, but uh, uh, I mean. Now, what are, what is what was the role of human beings? Human beings were supposed to only con contemplate on nature. Okay, but subsequently, civilization also taught us how human beings started controlling nature. Okay, there there was a shift from faculty of contemplation to faculty of control. Okay, that's why for Marx, human beings change the world. Human beings change the nature. Marx emphasized what is what is the basis of this? Marx emphasized the notion of praxis, practice. Okay, the 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 single science refers to the science of history. I mean, history of nature and history of man condition each other. History of nature and history of human species condition each other. There is always a dialectical process. According to according to Marx human beings live in and against nature. Human beings not only depend on nature for their survival, but also know how to control it, how to master over nature. Okay? That is why according to Marx, human beings uh, live in, I mean human beings live in and against nature. Okay? And knowledge comes from this kind of conflict with and by acting upon nature. 
Okay, that's why Marx said by acting upon nature, human beings not only change nature but also change the social relationships involved in it. Human beings, uh, by 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 acting upon nature, human beings not only change nature but also change themselves. Okay. It is it is only through practice that we know and change the world. It is only through practice we know and change nature. It in this context, okay, uh, as as um, a towering uh, uh, figure uh, uh, from People's Republic of China, Mao Shatum, okay, who said that. Uh, the proof of apple uh, is in its city. Okay. The, I mean, it is an empirical way of looking at the trajectory of development. Okay. And this, this, this the, it involves a dialectical process, I mean practice, uh, through, through practice we, we know and change nature, by changing, by, by knowing as well as changing nature we create knowledge okay and this new form of knowledge and or these new forms of knowledge okay they also change human nature that's why by acting upon nature human beings not only change nature but also change themselves okay according to mao shatung multiplicity of contradictions are hierarchical yeah. in a social formation some some uh, some principal contradictions subordinate several other contradictions okay suppose for suppose for marx okay nature does not be build machines machines are the products of human activity machines are the products of human action human labor okay i mean that is why Marx said that uh, who has cre created machines, okay, earlier literature used to uh, uh, attribute the creation of machines to some supernatural forces, um, I mean God. Okay. In this context, Marx interrogated this, this idea and Marx challenged this idea, I mean uh, Marx um, came up with a more modern view about this new order of society that no machines, um, uh, I mean nature does not build machines, God has not built machines, it machines are the products of uh, human labor, human activity, human action. Okay. In this context, uh, okay, Marx said that Darwin has God made redundant. Okay. It is only through human labor, human activity, human action that, that we have created this world, we have, we have tried to not only know this world, but also we have attempted to change this world. Okay. Okay. Uh, capitalism limits civilizing force of science. Okay. In, in capitalism, okay, in, in capitalist mode of production as, as Marx suggested, uh, that that nature, I mean that uh, mm, nature becomes denatured and humanity becomes dehumanized, and nature becomes a raw material, an object of utility. Okay. I mean, it is it is important to 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 humanize nature and naturalize human beings, which doesn't happen in capitalism. For Marx, okay. For Marx, in in capitalism, nature becomes denatured and humanity becomes dehumanized, and nature because nature is reduced to a raw material, an object of utility. Okay, understanding life at a molecular level will be reductionist. Okay, understanding life at a genetic level will be reductionist. Okay, if this is so. Then ideologically, uh, much of Marx's and uh, Engels' discussion on on ideology is metaphorical in character. We are now coming to theory of ideology, okay, by by Marx. 
I mean what are ideologies for, for, for Marx? Ideologies are fantasies, illusions, um, myths, reflections, inverted images, echoes of material life and so on. Many, but not all of these metaphors contain two theses about ideology. Okay? Marx as a theorist, I am not talking about Marx as an ideologue of the communist party, but Marx as a theorist. Okay? Many, but not all of these metaphors contain two theses of about ideology. I mean, I mean ideologies as fantasies, uh, illusions, myths, reflections, inverted images, echoes of material life and so on. Okay. It, 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 uh, the, these metaphors contain two theses about, about ideology. One thesis concerns its status as a reality, the other its status as knowledge. When I say knowledge, I mean co its, its cognitive status. For, for Marx, there are one way causal relations, uh, uh, causal links between material life and ideology that ideology and insubstantial epiphenomenon, I mean that is a reflection which depicts, but does not affect the course of uh, real historical life. Insubstantial epiphenomenon. Okay? In, in, in the German ideology, Marx said that materialism consists in asserting that, that thoughts are the phenomena, uh, uh, material life uh, are the phenomenon. A material life or, uh, or uh, uh, material life, their essence as against um, the idealist's assertion of the converse. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, idealists asserted that no. Uh, uh, I mean, there must be uh, determination in the last instance. Uh, and, and relative autonomy of the superstructures are clearly attempts to correct these lapses into economic reductionism. Okay? For, for, for Marx, if ideology is the dependent variable, I mean if ideology is the effect, then mode of production is the independent variable or the cause. Okay? But, uh, and, 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 and for Marx, in, in, in quest of truth, Marx as a theoretician, in quest of truth, in quest of knowledge, okay, one has to uh, go beyond the narrow confinements of her or his ideology. Okay. Once, once you move away from ideology, once you go move away from, from the narrow confinements of uh, your ideology, okay, then you confront science. Therein lies the 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 the, uh, the beauty of Marx's theory of science or theory of knowledge. Okay, the theory of science or the theory of knowledge. I mean, Marx's theory of science or theory of knowledge can be understood by analyzing and explain uh, and and explaining two of Marx's texts on scientific methodology. What are those two? Okay, the the first one, the German ideology and the second one, the methods of political economy. Okay? From these two texts, the German ideology on the one hand and the methods of political economy on the other, I mean six theses follow. Okay? Okay. This is very important. I mean German ideology because, because German, he was guided much by German, German philosophy uh, and, and methods of political economy, I mean British economy. Okay. These, these two uh, are very important. What are, what are those six theses which follow from these two texts on the German ideology and the methods of political economy? First, the positive science of history is the representation of the practical activity of the practical process of development of human beings. Okay. The, the, the first one, the positive science of history is the representation of the practical activity. Everything emanates from praxis, practice. Okay? And such representation or depiction consists in the observation and arrangement of historical material under the guidance of certain premises, certain conditions, certain starting points. 
okay, which are themselves to be made evident by the study of the material life of each historical epoch. Then what are these premises, these starting points, these conditions? Okay, premises in this sense are the axioms or, or first principles of the theoretical system of history. I mean the, the, the this is the third one, I mean premises thirdly, premises are the axioms or first principles of the theoretical system of history. Fourthly, the, the, the term premises refers to starting points in the real world from which the concrete study of history must proceed. And these premises are basic facts of social life, I mean what are those basic facts of social life, I mean maybe the individual, the real individuals, their activity and the material conditions under which they live. And these premises, I mean the given the raw data of scientific historical investigation can be verified in a purely empirical way and are empirically perceptible. Fifthly, the, the, the materialist method of knowledge production for Marx differs from that of the empiricists, okay, crude empiricists for whom history is a collection of dead facts. That is why materialist method again is different from empirical method. Okay. Not only that, sixthly, not only that, sixthly, what, what Marx uh, went further that, that the materialistic method is not speculative as metaphysicists do. Okay. Instead, the materialist methods always starts with observable and verifiable facts. Why? Why the materialist method is not speculative as metaphysicists do? No, precisely because the, the premises of metaphysics or the hitherto existing uh, philosophical investigations governed by the metaphysical school of thought, okay, they, they govern um, uh, the premises of metaphysics govern empirical investigations. Okay. That is why the materialist method okay, uh, oft, uh, always starts with observable and verifiable facts. Okay. Keeping this, 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 the broad contours of Marx's historical materialism, um, uh, uh, the, uh, I mean the Marx's materialist conception of history, the principles of dialectic theory of ideology uh, and, and theory of science uh, or, or theory of knowledge. Okay. Let us quickly uh, uh, look at uh, Weber's reflection on modernity, reflection of modernity. We are just trying to recapitulate bef before we move on to the, the structuralist interpretation of modernity by, by uh, Levi-Strauss and and Louis Althusser. Okay. Now, now what, how Weber did it? I mean, Weber contributed heavily to the to the development of substantive sociological theory and to the debate on methodology. Weber's uh, Weber's uh, methodological writings and theoretical positions are usually characterized as as affecting a reconciliation between positivism po between positivist and new Kantian positions. Though Weber's positions were not of course, entirely consistent throughout his life, okay, uh, it is possible to say that in general, uh, he rejected the view attributable to some new Kantians that the cultural sciences are exclusively concerned with the uniqueness of their objects of study and that the category of causality is inapplicable in them. Weber was committed to the widespread uh, Neo-Kantian insistence on the methodological peculiarities of the cultural sciences. For Weber, these peculiarities centered around the two related concepts of value relevance and interpretative understanding. I mean, the cultural uh, uh, sciences uh, differed from the natural um, in the uh, distinctive role of valuations in the formation of concepts and in the distinctive type of knowledge involved in them. And 
and a third area of methodological differences was thought by Weber to be the use of idealizations in the cultural sciences. Weber's famous definition of interpretative sociology encapsulates most of such points as, as sociology is a, is, a, is, a, um, is a science which attempts the interpretive understanding of social action in order thereby to arrive at a causal explanation of its course and effects and an and exposition of Weber's methodological position can usefully proceed uh, uh, with an uh, analysis of each of the concepts and contrasts involved in the definition. First, the concept of social action, the, uh, the characterization of sociology in terms of the understanding and explanation of social action involves two important contrasts. First, Weber is distinguishing the paradigmatic objects of sociological knowledge for him uh, 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 from the supra-individual social entities whose existence is supposed in much sociological theorizing and also everyday thinking about social relations. Weber does not actually deny the existence of such supra-individual social, uh, supra social entities, but argues that for, for interpretative sociology they must be such such. Uh, supra individual social entities must be treated um, as solely the resultants and modes of organization of the particular acts of individual persons. Weber's, Weber's position here would now be regarded as methodological individualist involving the claim that in so far as collectivities may be said to have characteristics independent of the individuals which make them up, those characteristics are to be uh, explained in terms of individual actors and their actions. Then, then such methodological individualist position refers to theoretical position holding that adequate sociological accounts necessarily involve reference to individuals, their interpretations of their circumstances and the reasons and motives uh, for the actions that they take. Weber says that such action by no means necessarily follows from the sharing of a common class situation. Prima facie, interpretive sociology refers to a variety of forms of sociology united by an emphasis on the necessity for sociologists to grasp or understand or interpret actors meanings. It can legitimately interpret course, uh, uh, I mean it can legitimately uh, interpret uh, a course of action in terms of concepts such as the state classes etc without commitment to any of the inter entities. Interpretative understanding, I mean it refers to a method that stresses the importance of understanding of intentional human action. I mean semantically any, any account is an interpretation that is why we have, we have already discussed how, how Weber considered understanding to be a method of elucidating the, the motivations for action which did not prelude the sociologist making generalizations from these data. In some, whilst this, there is a general commitment to empathy and understanding from the actor's point of view, the research that flows from interpretation is so varied as to be difficult to uh, categorize as a school possibly because the meaning of interpretation is itself subject to interpretation. Okay. Verstehen for, for Weber. Uh, is not a method at all, but an objective or an achievement or a goal. It is a distinctive type of knowledge which may be achieved by a variety of methods or no method at all. I mean for Weber, the concept of Verstehen or understanding refers primarily to the spontaneous and the immediate recognition of acts and their meanings in everyday life. Okay? And we have, we have also discussed how, how interpretative understanding of social action has two parts. I mean interpretation at the uh, uh, of the textual and uh, uh, linguistic meaning of a cultural product on the one hand and value interpretation. I mean when I say value be it social value, aesthetic value or, or cognitive value. I mean, I mean values for a sociologist are always objects of study. Okay? Interpretative understanding may be direct understanding or observational understanding and indirect understanding or explanatory understanding. Okay? We have also discussed a rule governed said culture uh, which is based on relevance, acceptability and elegance. Okay? 
we have discussed uh, uh, how explanation I mean when, when we talk about indirect or explanatory understanding how explanation must be adequate at the level of meaning as well as uh, at the level of statistical generalizations. I mean adequacy is based on generalizations and generalizations are based on experience. Okay? And, and the central dimensions of Weber's analysis are that economic, religious and power relations are cross, crucial sociological explanations on the basis of which Weber made three types of economic phenomena. I mean economic phenomena, economically relevant phenomena and economically conditioned phenomena. Economic phenomena when Weber referred to I mean institutions deliberately created and used for economic ends. I mean market economically relevant phenomena I mean legal and religious phenomena which are not primarily economic, but have consequences which are economic in nature in certain circumstances. I mean when, when Weber talked about economically conditioned phenomena I mean he referred to the stratification systems and the state are not directly the economic phenomena, but are affected in some way by the economic phenomena. That is why Weber said that economy and religion cannot be separated in our day to day life. So, far as practice is concerned. Okay? Then we have discussed Weber's interpretation of modernity as well as uh, Marx's web interpretation of modernity through the lenses of holism or totality, um, uh, reflexivity, uh, 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 rationality um, and, and social movements. Okay? Uh, and we have also discussed the, there are two primary differences between Weber and Marx on class. I mean the first is in their conception of the economic class structure that underlies class movements. Uh, I, mean, I mean for Marx classes are manifestations of economic differentiation, but for Weber classes are contingent upon life chances as well as causal components. Okay? For Marx we have as we have seen this I mean, uh, I mean the conception of the economic class structure uh, that underlies class movements can ultimately be reduced to a primary opposition between um, the exploited and the exploiters, those who live those who labor as well as those who live off their labor. For Weber however, economic situation is not so much a relationship as a given which uh, individuals bring to a market. Schematically, we can say that individuals bring their labor power or their skills or their ownership the means of production to a market and it is this market situation for Weber that generates uh, the life chances of each individual. I mean for, for Weber economic classes are more heterogeneous okay, um, uh, and less interactive than, than what Marx had envisioned. Okay. And secondly, the I mean the other major difference which Weber brings to his analysis of social movements is the concept of social closure. Weber treats social closure as a process whereby groups aim at restricting access to particularly desirable things, namely occupations, goods, status and so on. Much of Weber's writing deals with the extent to which successful collective action results in this kind of social closure for the sake of exercising a monopoly on something. Okay? This, is, this is very important and, and, and um, uh, we have also discussed uh, Weber's ideal types, I mean which are the models which describe uh, uh, rules of the way things uh, 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 happen in a way that makes sense to us. Thus, we might construct an ideal typical description of the way in which religions founded by a charismatic priest become over time highly structured and militant organizations. And the relationship of this model to the way things actually happen is then variable. In general, Weber says that it helps us develop these models at as abstracted a level as possible, so that the concepts become as unambiguous as possible and their interrelationship is as clear as possible. And these ideal types are then, then, then they do become uh, yardsticks against uh, which we can measure what actually happened. Okay? In other words, the ideal type is a, is a description of a particular logic or of, of process or of a rational sequence of events 
in the sense of one where their sequence has a meaning. Clearly, they will be far easier in the case of value rational or goal rational sequences since an assumption continued uh, custom tells us very little about the content of the custom and assumptions that emotions follow particular sequences are very risky. In other words, it is rationality itself whether goal rational or value rational that makes interpretation possible on the basis of a shared and reflexive participation in the social world. And, and beyond the specific case of case of rationalization as a, as a general uh, process in modernity, okay, then rationality for Weber is a concept which bridges the gap between sociology and its objects. I mean, I mean for example, rationality in either form is present as a tendency within society which may be approximated to a greater or lesser extent. I mean the sociologist can use this tendential rationality to make more sense of the actual process or events. Clearly then the more rationalized society becomes the deeper into modernity we go, the easier the sociologist's task should become and the closer their interpretations should correspond with what actually happens. Okay? I mean in the in the next lecture we are we are going to going to discuss the, the, the ultra modernist case, I mean the structuralist interpretation of, of the critical, uh, I mean the central pillars, the central political and philosophical foundations of modernist paradigm in sociology. I mean in the, um, in the works of uh, uh, Levi Strauss and, and Louis Althusser, what we will do, I mean we will we'll simultaneously discuss Levi Strauss uh, and Althusser. Um, I mean first we will go one by one and then we will we'll examine simultaneously both of both their works through the lenses of these central pillars of modernity. I mean holism uh, or totality, reflexivity, rationality and social movements. Thank you. <laughs>